Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have the distinct honor and privilege to have uh, Conwell Recchi here with us uh, this afternoon, uh, a prominent expert in exits. Uh, in, his, in his career, he has had uh, about 25 uh, exits by M&A. Uh, he has uh, managed six exits by IPO for companies as an investor. And on the personal side, he has uh, gone through two exits by IPO as a businessman. So I think when it comes to exits, uh, Conwell Recchi uh, knows what he's talking about. So uh, Conwell, the first question up for you is uh, the question of the segment. Um, does an entrepreneur really have to plan for an exit from day one? Well, so there are two schools of thought, you know. One says that uh, build a great company and uh, good things will happen. And yeah, the others say, well, you always have to have, you know, a you know, you know, plan you know, in the mind, you know, what's my exit strategy. I personally belong to the, uh, the first tool. You build a good company, you focus on you know, doing the right thing, you know. But you, you need to be always prepared. You know, need, you know, uh, Prashad mentioned earlier that you, know, you need to have your records you know, and boot tipping and all that, you know, all the contacts, everything ready. You know, when the, something happens, you are ready to, you know, to exit. But I personally believe that entrepreneurs should focus on getting this company, you know, customers, markets, growth, profitability, you know, stay on the fundamentals and you know, nice stuff will happen. So the entrepreneur, the early stage entrepreneur, mm -hmm. um, pre-series A, um, just getting formed, perhaps even pre-revenue, should that entrepreneur be thinking about an exit uh, in building his or her business plan? Well, so he has to have some some idea of what the potential exit would be because that becomes a part of the negotiations to that funding. You know, what, what is the potential exit? You know, the valuations of startups depend upon what you know, what's the potential exit, a possible exit. If you're building a, a company, you know, which is not complete company, you know, there's a product or technology you know, that will not you know, stand the test of standalone company down the road, then you have to have some idea, hey, somebody like Oracle will acquire me, or somebody like Intel will acquire me, you know, because uh, then, you know, you have to have, you know, uh, that kind of thing, you know, your valuations will depend upon, you know, what's a potential exit down the road. Entrepreneurs want to make their 10x, you know, or more, and, and, and they will work their way back from there. So you need to have some thoughts, you know, as to what's possible. IPOs are not something you can plan, you know, IPOs uh, happen. You know, the companies you know, become mature, that entrenched, established, you know, predict, you know, growth is predictable, you know, the, you know, the you know, you know, business model revenue is predictable. You know, for several years, you know, you know, you know, for, for IPO uh, to become possible. So that brings up something that you and I talked about, and that is how does planning for an exit change or morph over the life of the company. Now, you're talking about it, we were just talking about an early stage company, uh, perhaps is not necessarily planning for the exit, but should be thinking about things that uh, the entrepreneur is doing in the business so as not to upset the exit. But as the company matures, it, it becomes you know, revenue positive, cash flow positive, profitable, and is now perhaps looking for a liquidity event. How does that, how does the exit strategy then become a part of the business plan? So, so if you become profitable and cash flow positive, you know, then, then you are in cat bird seat, right? You know, but, you know, because then you don't have to, you know, to sweat it. You know, uh, you can, you know, you know, do, you, uh, do your thing and, uh, you, know, you know, you talk to many people. And it's when you are in trouble. You know, it's when, when you, know, you, know, you, know, you are in a short fuse, you know, and you always need more cash. You know, you know, that, that's when the real problem is, right? Uh, when the company matures, you know, you know, some, you know, you know, at minimum your investors want an exit. You know. The exit is by and large for investors, you know, you know, because that's, you know, that's where the word comes from. You know, VCs come in, they invest, and they want the exit out of the, that investment you know, because they have their fund life. And uh, you as an entrepreneur you know, have, have to pro provide that. You, know, you tell it to that one, you know, to, the, to the investors, you know, hey, you know, we'll provide you an exit. You know, VCs are not there forever. And the first and foremost thing is that you keep your, your paperwork clean. I, I was involved with the company, and the entrepreneur was a little bit cheap, and he didn't want to pay attorneys you know, for the, to attend the board meetings, and, uh, and offer them to be acquired. And the, one of the first thing, you know, the potential acquirers, uh, acquirers said, 
you know, legal and, and, you know, and financial due diligence, right? And they need a, a, a attorney, you know, the law firm, you know, a deep patented law firm with insurance to sign off on the, you know, on the papers. They say that everything is fine. It took him 13 months to retreat all the records because he didn't want to spend, you know, yeah, but it yeah, was a yeah, fairly nominal amount of money yeah, for the attorneys to attend the board meetings and yeah, teach the records. And at the end, yeah, they had to spend more money and more time to retreate all the records. So you know, like Prashad mentioned, yeah, you have to be prepared every step of the way yeah, to be you know, a trial. If somebody wants, if Lady Lut comes and knocks at your door and says, hey, we want to trial you for unholy sum, you need to be able to sell. So we heard from the last panel that uh, there were some lessons learned um, uh, with regard to where you incorporate your company and how you do some of your tax planning. Um, you just mentioned uh, an experience with one company where there's some lessons learned about keeping the books clean uh, so that you don't have to redo them uh, just on the eve of an exit. Um, what, are, what are some of the other common mistakes you've seen uh, over your career where young entrepreneurs didn't have their eye on an exit and therefore were doing things structurally within the company that ended up interfering with the exit? Yeah, well, yeah, I am not much, for, you know, much of a financial engineer, you know, how to interpret right you know, for the exit purposes. And as a matter of fact, I'm not quite on top of it. You know, you know, they will advise you a lot of the way you know, how to keep your company you know, clean and, and ready you know, you know, in case you know, something was to happen. The IPOs require a lot more you know, work than, than the mergers. But mergers, you know, when somebody acquires you, you know, they need to make sure that... Oh, yeah, one of the areas I should have mentioned to you was intellectual property also. You know, the ownership of intellectual property, the rights that you give to some of the customers of your intellectual property, that becomes a, a problem at the end of uh, at the end you know, for the merger. We had a, an issue in one of the, the companies where it took six months you know, to get the clarity as to what rights you know, some of the customers had you know, as a part of our initial sales. You know, when we made initial sales, you know, the large customers required us to give them certain rights. And uh, yeah, there was, was also we had used somebody else's technology in our part at, in one of the earlier phases of our, our you know, business. We stopped using that technology and uh, along the way, and we were still paying them royalty even though we were not using technology, and that became a problem because that other company got acquired by competition of, of our acquirer. And uh, so you need to have a fair amount of clarity as to you know, where your IP you know, is coming from and, you know, and who owns it clearly. So when the new guys come in to look at your stuff, you know, you know you're ready. I was going to ask you exactly that about the intellectual property. As an investor, when you were uh, considering investing in a company, um, with regard to the intellectual property, to what extent are, are you as an investor looking at uh, how it is protected, the intellectual property of the company itself, but also perhaps intellectual property that the company is licensing from others? Do you build that into your uh, in investment analysis? Oh, yes, absolutely. You know, when we are doing investments, you know, we are early stage investors, so it's not a problem very often. But you know, every once in a while, somebody leaves with a licensed technology from from a previous employer or or or, or you know, you know, then you have to spend a fair amount of time because uh, you know, you know, that is a sore area at the end. You know who owns what and uh, you know what rights everybody has. And if, if you know sometimes you get licensed technology, but they say, well, you can use it in your products, but you cannot pass it on to some, to your follow you know successor. And uh, you know the new acquirer needs that technology and you don't have rights to give it to, the, to him. So you need to have a fairly clean you know, ownership you know, and rights you know, if you're going to use any technology in your product. And we as investors you know, go through the proper diligence uh, to make sure that everything in the company is uh, you know, owned clearly and, and has a proper rights. You, know, you get in trouble at the end otherwise. All right, uh, so Kamal, you're an early stage investor, so you really see these companies uh, from their origin through the exit or the liquidity event. Um, given all of your experience in doing this, I think you have a pretty good sense of when a company is approaching that inflection point where it's getting ready for an exit, whether it's M&A or, or, or it's an IPO. When you begin to sense that, what do you do as, a, as an investor and as a board member to begin counseling the management team on how to really get the company ready? 
you know, I, as a mentor, add a lot of value in the early days of the company as a, as a, as a you yeah, know, when the entrepreneurs that's growing. But my maximum value had, in most cases, been at the very end. You know, Prashad's company, you know, he, you know, Tata Bari's company, you know, he had been at it for 11, 12 years. And he was doing all right, you know, an offer came to be acquired, and almost all the board members uh, looked around and said, yeah, let's, yeah, yeah, we are getting tired, let's, let's get, get out. I had a chat with Prasad, hey, you are finally arriving, and your value will double every six to months to a year. And you know, you know, right now is not the time to be selling. He said, well, my other investors are asking me to sell. I said, well, yeah. they waited 11 years, they will wait for another year or two. And a you know, year later, we sold the same company at four ads. You know, and if I had not intervened, you know, with him in private, and uh, you know, and, uh, and even you know, you know, the value iteration becomes very rapid at the end. You know, when when you find your market, when you find your trusts, when your revenue starts to happen, and yeah, you know, the life you know, eleven years, you know, he, he was worth ads, and last year was saying when not selling company, he was worth four ads, and uh, you know, so by you know, seventy five percent of the value I added for him was in, with that one piece of advice. And I have seen that uh, about three or four times now. We're you know, selling too early because you're tired, or, or asking for too much price, you know, where you know, you're unreasonably you know, optimistic. You know, is the other case you know, where you end up not selling you know, uh, because uh, you wanted, here's a company, you know, they wanted a billion dollars, the offer was at, on the table was $800 million. And they didn't sell. And 18 months later, they sold at $50 million. Yeah. And I was there in that company also, and I was overruled by the other VCs. You know, we need a neat billion, and I kept saying $800 million is pretty good yeah, price for this company. And we didn't sell, and the markets, you know, this is dot com crash. It started to happen, and we ended up selling company at $50 million 18 months later. So, so yeah, there is a value add at the end, you know, where you make sure that, you know, you, you know, you add, don't sell too cheap and don't become too unreasonable. You know, and, and people like me who have been you know, through this thing 25 times, like you mentioned, you know, have a lot more instinct you know, than an entrepreneur will have because you know, this is the first time he's doing it. Well, our time is just about up, Conwall, but uh, before we leave, uh, what one point, what t one takeaway could you leave with the entrepreneurs that are in the audience today um, assuming that we have entrepreneurs out in the audience everywhere from, from origin just being founded today to perhaps late stage, what, what little nugget of wisdom can you leave them today? Uh, like I said at the start, you know, the exits happen, you know, the IPOs you know, are something which is very, uh, they happen, but rarely, you, know, you need to stay focused on keeping the company on, on the right path with respect to customers, technology, products, profitability and have your nose clean every step of the way. You know, if budget was to happen, you should be able to turn on dime. You know, if you, you cannot be saying that I will clean the boots up later, I will you know, get the IP stuff done later, I'll have the contracts you know, and done properly. Every step of the way, you have to be ready. And so my advice to entrepreneurs is that uh, you should run your business as if, you know, like Prasad mentioned, that's what did my you know, phrase, you know, due diligence is happening tomorrow. Very good, Conwell, thank you very much.